All right. Hello, friends of the IACL blog, and welcome to another book interview. I'm Jesse Hardery, and I'm one of the assistant editors of the blog. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by professors Tom Ginsberg and Benjamin Chantal to discuss their new edited collection, Buddhism and Comparative Constitutional Law, published by Cambridge University Press. Professor Ginsberg is, among other things, the Leo Spitz Professor at the University of Chicago Law School, the Director of the Comparative Constitutions Project, and a Senior Advisor for the Constitution Building Program at International IDEA. He has also held visiting professorships at universities in Israel, South Korea, Japan, Italy, among other countries. His research focuses on comparative and international law from an interdisciplinary perspective, and he's published widely in these fields, as I'm sure our listeners will know. Professor Chantal is, among other things, a professor of Buddhist studies and the head of the religion program at the University of Otago, and is the co-director of the Otago Center for Law and Society. His research examines the intersections of religion, law, and politics in late colonial and contemporary Southeast Asia. He is notably the author of the book Buddhism, Politics, and the Limits of Law, published in 2016 by Cambridge University Press. So thanks to both of you for taking the time uh, to talk to us about this uh, new book. Uh, and I have the book here, so I'll sort of just put it up for our listeners uh, so they can see the book. Um, having read the book, I have to say that it's I found it to be like a really rich read. Um, so I have a background in history and Asian studies. Um, and have sort of continued to engage with Asia um, in my own work, no notably Burma um, and India. And, and I found the book to be sort of really interesting for the range of countries that it covered, but also sort of the historical and theoretical angles that sort of come out in the book, um, which I think sort of makes it unique um, and, and brings sort of a nuance, um, sort of a nuance lends to some, some broader debates that are happening in, in comparative constitutional law. Um, and so in light of that, I'm, I'm sort of wondering if you can tell us a bit uh, more about sort of the book and, and the contributors that you've both sort of brought together for this collection. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in, I guess. I'll, um, thanks, Jesse, for, for, for having us. And, and, it's, and thank you for your nice comments about the book. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a kind of, a, a, you know, an unusual group that we brought together for sure. Uh, so Tom and I met, um, I was a graduate student. I did my PhD at the University of Chicago in the history of religions. And, uh, but I also kind of walked across the midway. I tried to take some classes in the law school and I met Tom, I think through somehow through the law school connections. And basically the book it was sort of gestating for a long time. I mean, so this was, I'm talking about, um, you know, 2011, 2010, 2012, something like around there that we sort of started these conversations basically on this, around this issue. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about the book was the ability for us, and we I, I can tell you more about you know, how this all unfolded, but I think, you know, in, in response to your media question, you know, one of the fun things about this book was that we got to bring together, you know, both of our Rolodexes of, of people who kind of are interested in this stuff, right? So, um, I, you know, I do a lot of work with people who are philologists and textual scholars, uh, people in the Buddhist studies world who may be, you know, working with manuscripts, um, so we had, you know, a representation from that, those kind of folks. Um, we also had representation from ethnographers, uh, uh, linguistic anthropologists in Sri Lanka and, um, you know, Levy McLaughlin, who, uh, you know, works in Japan, uh, does ethnography there. Um, you know, in addition to scholars of law and comparative constitutional law, right? So uh, one of the things that we, we thought was really exciting that we um, were, were sort of, I guess, happy, you know, excited to do was that we had this sort of group of scholars who work in, in you know, historical and, and social scientific studies of, you know, Buddhist societies mainly. Uh, but then we also got to bring together some people who work on Hindu law and sort of colonial India, uh, people who work in, in canon law, you know, this sort of, um, you know, uh, Christian canon law. So uh, Dick Helmholtz at the University of Chicago. And, and um, Clark Lombardi, who works on Islamic law, we also got to sort of bring those people into the conversation, too. So there's chapters in the book, um, you know, representing kind of all those different areas, as well as people who work in, um, you know, from the discipline of law itself. W what would you add, Tom? Well, I just say a little bit about the actual genesis of the project. So, you know, we've been in conversation for a while and then we thought, well, let's, you know, try to do something specifically on comparative constitutional law. 
the, the you know, relevance of Buddhism to these Buddhist majority polities in which we've both done work was sort of obvious to us, but in a latent sense. It had never really been articulated. And we thought it'd be interesting to get some people together. So we applied for a grant from the American National Science Foundation for a conference. And then actually the conference was all scheduled and COVID hit. And we had to be very nimble here. And what we did is we turned a single you know, weekend conference into a series of nine or 10 weeks of um, you know, seminar, which was broadcast on Zoom. And that turned out to be quite fortuitous. We were able to open it up to the Buddhist world um, everywhere. And uh, we had a class at the University of Chicago that was organized around it. And, you know, I think it also sort of contributed to the generative, somewhat experimental nature of the project, um, which, you know, we're really happy to happy to have done, learned a lot. That That's awesome. I mean, I, I picking up on sort of the point about the genesis of the project, I don't know, Professor Chantal, if you wanted to sort of pick up on that, what sort of, obviously you've been working, you, you know, your book in 2016 sort of touches on some of the themes that come up in the book, but but the book goes a bit further than that. So I wonder if you have anything to add on, on sort of the genesis. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess there's, you know, we, we go into an even more detailed arc here too, and that, you know, somewhere between the, when my book came out and this, Tom and I also were involved in, in, in editing a journal, uh, a special issue on sort of um, social uh, law and society in, in Buddhist context or, you know, socio legal studies relating to Buddhism. And so I think there, there, there was a way in which, um, you know, that book that that was, you know, came out of my dissertation and then, you know, that was running alongside with these conversations with Tom. Um, I think all of this was pushing in the direction of, you know, what would it mean to take ser Buddhism seriously in a lot of the conversations that are going on in comparative constitutional law and not just in the in the context of Sri Lanka, but, you know, comparatively. So I think, you know, one of the interesting things that um I guess came out of of the discussions that we had over the course of this these nine sessions was uh, the themes and the and the uh, uh, I guess dynamics that you see cross you know cross regionally and, and cross culturally as it relates to Buddhism and, and, and public law and there you know we we didn't actually have strong ideas going into the project I mean it was an inductive project so we. We sort of basically said to everyone, you know, write on whatever you like, as long as it's kind of related to this theme. Um, right. But what we found is that what that what that did is that it, it, if we didn't narrowly circumscribe things, we had these kind of really interesting reflections on these different ways in which Buddhism and constitutional culture might intersect in ways that we didn't necessarily expect. So I think, you know, most people going into a project like this or reading this book will expect Okay, well, you're gonna you're gonna talk about you know the you know constitutional clauses related to Buddhism and you know the you know litigation around that. You're gonna talk about like the role of Buddhist monks or in you know um, drafting constitutions or whatever. And you know that kind of stuff was there. Uh, but we also found that you know Buddhist monastic fraternities who were like purposefully emulating the form of constitutional law in their own um, you know organizational codes. Uh, we found, you know, in the case of Japan, Le Levy wrote this, you know, wonderful chapter in which he talks about Soka Gakkai as having a kind of a, const a streak of constitutional devotion within it. You know, they have like um, uh, holidays dedicated to the constitution and actually constitutional provisions really orient the way in which they understand and um, act as Buddhists in the world. Uh, you know, um, uh, Krishanta Fredericks in the context of Sri Lanka wrote about the way in which a new Buddhist movement, really important Buddhist movement in Sri Lanka, is emulating the linguistic policies of Sri Lanka's national constitution in its own. Uh, so we, so there was just all these kind of interesting and unexpected uh, lines of sight that were opened up when you when you looked at these things um, comparatively. Right. Yeah, I, I think I, I would say sort of picking up on that, that one of the things that sort of came out was that, you know, it's it's not only sort of Buddhism impact in constitutional norms, but as you say, you know, you, we have the opposite happening. Um, and so we see sort of the two themes come out in the book, I think, quite nicely, which is interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you can both speak to sort of the scope of the book um, and, and, and what led to sort of the decision not only to engage with Asia, because of course, that's a huge part of the book, um, but also with broader sort of historical and theoretical discussions about you know, constitutional law and the relationship between religion and law. So as you mentioned, you know, we've got these chapters near the end that sort of 
go into other areas. So Islamic law, canon law. Um, and, and so I, I'm wondering if you could sort of speak to that for our listeners that might be interested in, in this sort of aspect of the book. Yeah, let me jump in here. Um, sometimes we talk about what the book isn't first. So this is right. not a normative take on Buddhist constitutionalism. You know, that's right. something that we've got some examples. The Dalai Lama has spoken to it. Uh, the country of Bhutan is sort of trying to, to work something out in this regard. Uh, but we are not normative theorists. We were very much socio-legal scholars trying to see what's out there, uh, which, you know, and, and, and that involves taking the good with the bad, right? We obviously, you know, those who follow the region know that Buddhist actors have sometimes been, you know, at the forefront of nationalist or jingoist movements, uh, including promoting violence and such. And so we wanted to be sort of neutral in terms of our approach. Uh, and then, um, you know, the other thing that we're really, you know, not doing in some sense is um, trying to define Buddhist constitutionalism, you know, as a, as a concept. We were very open, as Ben said, in our inductive approach. What we were doing is trying to get the full range to the extent we could. Uh, Buddhist majority societies, there are seven of them, at least maybe eight. Uh, and we have chapters which discuss, you know, politics in most of them. We were not able to get a chapter on Laos, uh, just there are relevant people we couldn't find at, in time. And uh, if I can say one thing that we left out that I wish we had dealt with, and you know, if we do a second version or subsequent follow-up project, the one thing we did leave out was uh, Ambedkarites in India, because of course Ambedkar played this crucial role and Buddhist ideas were informing him, um, ideas of equality, which are obviously in Buddhism. Um, but also, um, you know, broader sort of approaches to how one would construct an ideal society. So I mean, maybe we'll do something normative in which we engage with the Ambedkarites. So, uh, but, you know, within the scope of what we did, we have chapters from all these different countries, including Leninist countries, which have their distinct approach, um, historical chapter on Mongolia. Um, so in any case, we tried to be very broad, very open but we also, I think, both have the sense there's much more to do. We could easily do a second volume um, of all the things we missed. Now you're going to have to keep your promise on that. <laughs> um, anything to add to that, um, Professor Chantal? Um, I, no, I think you know, Tom's really said it. You know, the, the I guess the guiding logic, uh, you know, was to get geographical representation as much as we right. could. Um, and then to have this sort of comparative uh, religious, you know, the comparative kind of religious law aspect as well. And, you know, beyond that, I think we were we were pretty open. I mean, the other, the, the other place, Tom, that, that, that we would both say that we probably overlooked was, um, you know, looking like, well, although Taiwan, uh, Andre La Liberté's chapter talks about Taiwan. Um, but uh, Tom uh, gave a talk there recently in which um, I think we realized, and Singapore for that matter, that there was much more to be done and said about those particular jurisdictions, um, you know, kind of in and of themselves, basically, and the forms of Buddhism there being uh, unique enough to have their own story that that, that probably needed to be told. Right. Um, I, I, I guess picking up on that, what, what you know, you, you sort of alluding to the fact that this is sort of the start of something, right, that, that there's so much more work to do. Um, I guess, what, what do you both hope to see as sort of the book's contribution or the collection's contribution to, you know, constitutional and public law in, in Asia specifically, but, you know, more broadly as that sort of discussion sort of, I guess, kicks off. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if, if you want to start start us off, um, Professor Chantal. I mean, for, for me, I there's a number of things for me. I think methodologically, I. I, I hope the book makes a case for bringing kind of multiple disciplinary backgrounds into the conversation on comparative constitutional studies. And I, I, I know that this is a, a, something that we, I think everyone would agree that we want to do this. It, you know, it doesn't all, often happen, you know, um, that you get this kind of methodological diversity in, in volume. So that, I guess that's a simple thing. I think at a more, at, at, at a level of kind of theoretical intervention, or, or maybe I suppose this is still methodological, um, you know, decentering the kind of standard models that we think with for religion and constitutional law questions over the last 20 years is another one. So, you know, I think we've been 
pretty good as a field at like theorizing, you know, what is like what's what does secular constitutional forms entail? Uh, I think we've also been good uh, at, at thinking about Islam and constitutional law and Islamic constitutionalism. Um, I hope this book sort of pries the door open a little bit more to think about um, other ways in which the question of religion and constitutional law can be construed uh, through other traditions of thought, right? So there are questions that come up in the history of uh, constitutional formation and implementation in the Buddhist world uh, that you wouldn't kind of necessarily expect if you were just taking as your models either the a kind of Islamic constitutional model or a um, you know Western secular liberal one, right? So questions about the category of religion look different in the Buddhist world, and I so I think there's um, you know something to be gained there from just kind of opening up that territory a bit more. And I guess I would just say that, that maybe the third thing is real attention, and I, and again this is also a trend that we see in comparative constitutional studies, but one that I think is um, that, that seemed really important to me coming out of this project was this the questions of constitutional culture, right? Small C, constitu both constitutional small c culture and small C constitutionalism. And, I, and again, I think there's a way in which those two things interact. Uh, and, and maybe the, maybe they're the same in some people's mind, but um, the way in which, you know, that becomes really important. And in, and maybe for me as one of the big actors in uh, kind of explaining outcomes in different parts of the world, particularly in these uh, Buddhist majority jurisdictions that we looked at here. Right. Hey, Tom. Professor, yeah, Professor Ginsburg. Yeah, I just add, you okay. know, as I said earlier, I mean, we, we have this sense from operating and working in these societies that, you know, the standard institutional forms of, you know, Western origin constitutionalism operate differently. Everyone who works, you know, in these countries feels that. And yet, you know, it's not to say that they're superfluous. They channel power. But the basic ontologies of power that are channeled uh, in some sense are prior, obviously, to the emergence of these Western constitutional forms. And so you're seeing, um, Matt Walton calls them, you know, a moral, moral universe, right? You've got this different moral universe. And the way that these institutions operate, you know, in a different moral universe is just really fascinating to me. I think that there's much more to do, but the book already has, you know, articulated in some of the chapters uh, that by Kim Tong, Tong uh, Sakun Rong Wun, for example, you know, really, really does a nice job of this. Asanga Welikala also. And we just begin to, you know, ask more questions about that. So I hope that'll be a great contribution. I think in some sense, it's also a model for socio-legal studies for how to do a kind of inductive project. Like, and this is one thing which I'm a big promoter of collaboration. The fact is that, you know, our material incentives as scholars sometimes, you know, discourage collaboration. Um, you know, tenure committees and all the nonsense, the people who count how many articles you did, you know, in the, they discount jointly authored stuff. I really oppose all that. I think it's quite regressive. Um, you know, the fact is Ben and I bring different things to the table, we bring different networks, we've been able to work together. The broader group of, you know, a dozen or more scholars who were involved in this would never have met were it not for this project. Even those doing Buddhist studies in different parts of the world don't necessarily interact. And so there's something very collaborative about the whole thing um, that I think is really, really valuable, even if our world doesn't value that kind of collaboration as much as it should. So, you know, the idea that you just launch into a project without knowing where it's going to go, without no, no single person could master all of these languages and jurisdictions. It's got to be collective. And yet collectively, we can make some progress and point the way and ease the way for uh, the next projects. Yeah. And I, I mean, would, oh, no, sorry, ahead, yeah, I, I just said, you know, you know we, we, we gave some talks about this project in, um, uh, you know, Tom was in Taiwan and, and he was in Bhutan and we, we talked about it in Thailand and uh, in Singapore and, um, you know, it's kind of interesting sometimes, you know, you go to these places, you, the, the, the port of entry was often through our colleagues in political science or law. You know, in some cases, like people in the law programs, of political, they like fully never met or knew what was going on in Buddhist studies, right? And these are people who, you know, are otherwise kind of interested in the topic, right? So it, it was, it was interesting to see the way in which, um, you know, even just in the kind of like the, the book talk kind of uh, setting, People were sort of coming together from across disciplines, and there was some there were some cool conversations that came out of that. Yeah, I mean, well, it sort of seems that way in the sense that when I sort of when I was reading the book, I thought one of the strengths was just like the variety that that 
like, you know, what I was reading in the chapters, like everybody sort of was coming at it through their own lens. And I thought that sort of really made the book what it what it is. Um, and, and in particular, you know, so, sort of going back to what I was saying earlier, like just the you've got those three chapters at the beginning that I think set it up quite well. And then, of course, you've got the thematic chapters. But then at the end, I, I thought, you know, it really brought it all sort of together nicely in, in the sense that if you're interested in sort of religion and law generally, right, beyond, beyond sort of Buddhism, um, you know, this book, I think, will be interesting um, to, to our listeners who are interested in, in that sort of broader project and that broader understanding of constitutionalism. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's, I, I, anyway, I'm sort of repeating myself about how fascinating it was, but, um, I guess my, my sort of, before I get to my last question, I'm wondering what challenges did you guys face in sort of preparing this book? You sort of alluded to sort of the COVID, um, you know, uh, story, but, um, I, I, I wonder if, if, was that sort of the main challenge, um, or, or were there any others sort of in preparing this, this collection? I just say, you know, that was a challenge that I think we turned into an opportunity. In some sense, I feel like the project was better for COVID because we were able to, you know, bring in more, more way more people than we would have, including a lot of lay people. You know, we'd have over 100 people, you know, beaming in from around the world to watch the scholarly or to engage with the scholarly uh, process. And we brought more students in. So that turned out to be OK. Um, you know, I think finding people who work on these questions in some of the jurisdictions is really, really hard. It's a kind of discrete angle that we're offering. Right. And um, of course, as we say in the introduction, you know, the whole field of Buddhist law is a kind of missing category that, you know, as Rebecca French and Mark Nathan have written about very recently, um, obviously there's law in Buddhist countries and that was Buddhist informed law or Buddhist law, but the study of it is so nascent that that was a real challenge to oh. find, you know, to address things. And so you could imagine in 20 years, you'd have very coherent volumes where you're looking at exactly the sim same stuff. Let me just add one other thing, which is in general, one of the reasons that there hasn't been articulated a category of Buddhist law is that the records, the pre-modern records in many societies are not great. And that's, of course, because they were, you know, the records are being written on palm leaves, you know, which degrade and not carved into stone as in the Middle East or something like that. And so we just don't know a lot about the historical part. And that's one reason is the field has taken quite a while to uh, begin to form. Right. Yeah, but I, I would also say that I would underscore Tom's point about that, about, uh, you know, there's a way in which this is a kind of a, um, uh, in almost like a habitual hole in scholarship, because there's this, there's these sort of assumptions built into Buddhist studies or, you know, hangovers, really. I don't think most Buddhist studies scholars would say, but nonetheless, shape the field a little bit that you know buddhism isn't really about law and politics you know that that um even the category of buddhist law is a kind of contested one um and therefore if you're you know going into the field of buddhist studies you you know you you sort of disavow kind of a lot of people would um you know these kinds of questions or or these kinds of questions at, at least until recently not i think now it's changing you know i've been given somewhat short shrift and then you know and same in comparative constitutional law jesse i, I I can't imagine you're doing much work on, um, you, know, or, you know, this question of like Buddhist constitutionalism is, I think the title of the book is maybe interesting because it's kind of counterintuitive to that field that, you know, Buddhism is this, that, you know, comparative constitutional law is not concerned with religion, and particularly not a religion that's considered to be as otherworldly and politically disengaged in, in pop culture as, as Buddhism. And so there's, you know, there's that, I think whenever you go into this kind of project, there's some halo of that, that that, that often will, I don't know, Tom, with your experience, like you would find, you'd, you'd approach people, even people who you think would be like natural to write about this. And they'd be like, well, that's not really what I do, you know? Um, and so there's, I think just getting, surmounting those kinds of obstacles was something that we, uh, I, th I think we had fun doing, but it was definitely, it was there. And, you know, the fact that we're there, there aren't people writing about this topic in, in the context of Lao, for example, um, you know, we really struggled to find people and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, thank God Son wrote for, on Vietnam. I mean, it was, uh, uh, I think this means that because of those sort of that halo of, of expectations that, that, you know, people aren't necessarily asking these questions yet. Right. Right. Um, well, I guess, I guess the last question then, um, is sort of what's next for, for both of you af 
after this. Of course, we already have Tom's promise that there will be a second book, so we know about that. Um, <laughs> um, but but sort of what's keeping you guys busy um, uh, these days? I, I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to deal with this question of Buddhist law. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I've got, I've, just, be, just before we got on, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to finish a manuscript right now that basically looks at the monastic legal system in Sri Lanka from the 19th century onward. And okay. in the context of asking, you know, this kind of, sort of what is Buddhist law in there? What's monastic law? And, you know, the, the direction I'm heading in that book is really talking about the sort of deep pluralism, the the interlegality of monastic law and state law in 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 a place like Sri Lanka and, and by uh, extension in other places. So, but doing that, you know, with I mean, this is a project based on you know reading primary sources and manuscripts, and I did a whole bunch of ethnographic work. I um, there's monastic courts in Sri Lanka. One of the one of the fraternities there has this elaborate system of judges and judicial training and judicial manuals, and so I, I, it's, it's kind of getting into that stuff and explaining describing what it is, explaining how it came about and, and how it shows us something about the nature of, 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 of legal culture, basically, this, the, the interlegal nature of all, I would say, all legal cultures. The banality of legal pluralism is, is a phrase I'm playing with at the moment. Um, but then I have another project, which I, reached, I was invited to do, and I, I have to feel like I have to say that because it, otherwise, like I don't have this kind of confidence or hubris to do this project if I wasn't invited, but I was invited to write a book for a series basically on Buddhist law. So do, so a book that would be like a, um, make a case for this trans-historical, trans-cultural, you know, collect, you know, it, albeit like super internally diverse collection of legalisms that we could call Buddhist law. So looking at that in Asia, you know, so that's, you know, watch this space. I'm super intimidated, but I do have a, a contract to do that. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So basically, everybody who's who who is interested in in this book will sort of want to follow uh, what's coming next, I guess. <laughs> uh, Tom. Yeah, I should add that we have a joint paper coming out in the Journal yeah. of Asian Studies on ah. the relationship between Theravada Buddhism and democracy, and what we're oh. calling a concept called Sangha capture, the way that sort of you know authoritarian or proto-authoritarian states can can use the Sangha to sort of suppress dem democratic movements. Um, so we've been thinking about the role of Buddhism and democracy together. I have this, uh, in this area, this kind of theory as to why there's never been a category of Buddhist law, which is a big trans-historical inquiry I, to, to answer that question properly, which I'd like to do together with Ben at some point. Um, and then, of course, I always have all my other various activities I'm doing. I'm spending a lot of time, just for your listeners to know, on issues of academic freedom and free expression, which are extremely troubled in the United States and other jurisdictions. And so trying to do something uh, administratively and intellectually on that topic. Amazing. Well, we we'll sort of look forward, I guess, to the outcome of sort of all of these, all of these projects. Um, and I'm sure our listeners will sort of stay tuned for that. Um, so thanks again so much for sort of taking the time, both of you, to sort of chat with us today about this um, this great book. Um, and, and to our listeners, thank you as well for joining us today. If you enjoyed the discussion and are interested in getting a hold of this book, you can head over to our new titles section on the website for more information. You Jesse, can also keep up to date. Oh, sorry yeah, to yeah. Can, we just, nope. can we just say that the books are t available totally open access for free at the Cambridge website too? Perfect. And we will, so we will also link to that in the new titles section. So uh, our listeners will be able to see that. Um, and so if you want to also keep up to date with the blog generally, you can follow us on Twitter and subscribe to the mailing list. Um, and finally, if you've recently published a book on constitutional law and you're interested in doing a book interview, you can get in touch with us at iacl.blogeditor at gmail.com. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>